The following show features stories from the ADRA network. ADRA is the Adventist Development and Relief Agency, a ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We strive to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and share God's love and compassion to people in every corner of the world. Each story you see in this series represents our mission to change the world one life at a time. To learn more, please visit us online at adra.ca. They killed your sister? Yes, I got it. Your sister? Yes. Shot by soldiers? You have lost address. You have lost nationality. They lose their dignity. Everything is lost. I can't even fathom what it might feel like to just go with the clothes on your back somewhere and you don't know if you're going to make it back home. So for us to plant it, we shall only fix one cutting like this into the soil. They aren't being given a handout. They are literally being given seeds for a sustainable future. We pray that soon there will be brotherhood in the, in the whole continent. I believe we are all one. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what tribe you belong to. We believe that God created man in his own image. God is the center of what we do. You can see in the faces of these kids that hope is not lost, that love is not lost. This world of ours is more beautiful, more complicated, and more inspiring than we could ever imagine. My name is Sanjay. And this is the story of a journey with Adra to serve a hurting world. I've spent the last six months seeing a side of our planet that not many people get to see, witnessing the most incredible challenges and the most extraordinary hope. Together, we've got a chance to impact the world in a whole new way. This is A Closer Walk. In the heart of Africa is Uganda, a country with a landscape as diverse as the people who inhabit it. Lake Victoria, which lies along its southeast border, is the source waters for the Nile River, a river that runs over 4,000 miles before finding its way to the Mediterranean Sea. But beyond this tranquil landscape, there is a darker side. This part of Africa has a complicated and violent past. For almost a decade, the Lord's Resistance Army, led by Joseph Kony, terrorized northern Uganda and displaced two million people, almost 95% of that region's population. And to the north, conditions are even worse. The violent conflict in South Sudan has forced millions from their homes. In December of 2013, a civil war began between supporters of the president, Salva Kiir, and his ex-deputy, Raik Mashar. Since the start of this most recent conflict, over a million people have been displaced, and 400,000 have fled to neighboring countries. A country already overfilled with a displaced population, Uganda is now struggling to find a way to take in the thousands of refugees fleeing South Sudan. Life of a refugee is the most difficult life that you want to live. When you are a refugee, you live in a country where you don't have your own resources. You depend on other people to provide for you, to provide for your family. It's not something that you would like to do. 
it's a very, very pathetic situation. To be a refugee, it's not very easy life. Booker Ajuaga has been working for 27 years with refugees around Africa. Originally from Kenya, he now lives in Uganda, where he is helping with the resettlement of refugees from South Sudan. How close are we to the South Sudanese border? 10 kilometers, it's not very far, just be behind us. So South Sudan is behind us? Yeah, South Sudan is behind us. And the refugees would walk and then go to the, the, the intake center over there? Absolutely, that's what they do. To all of these different buildings that we see over here, this is all part of the refugee settlement? All this is refugees in the settlement. How do they decide where do they live here? After registration, they are allocated pieces of land. Like you see down there, unlike other places where the government owns places of resettlement. Here, the local community themselves decided on their own to give the South, South Sudanese refugees places to resettle and live as brothers and sisters. Nayumanzi is a refugee center in the Ajumani district of northern Uganda. Refugees come first to the intake center to be accounted for before being assigned to a settlement. This makeshift camp of temporary tents can be home for a few days or a few months, depending on how quickly space can be found in the settlements. In the 10 months since the conflict began, there have been over 80,000 refugees who have come to Ajumani. At one time, there were as many as 25,000 refugees staying at the intake center, with several thousand more arriving each day. They used to come in thousands, but now the number that is coming is reduced. We, we say about 20 people per day arriving. The number is small that come every day, but the people are still being accommodated. Unfortunately, finding space for people is not the only challenge. Even those who have been placed into settlements struggle to find the most basic necessities. Ayan is a mother who fled South Sudan with only her three small children and the clothes on their back. This is not an uncommon story. An overwhelming majority of the world's refugees are women and children. It's a very hard tormenting experience. When these people come, they came with a lost hope. You have lost address. You have lost nationality. They lose their dignity. Everything is lost. 80% of the world's refugees end up in developing countries that lack the infrastructure to accommodate them. The reality is in the areas where we have our biggest turmoil, where people are fleeing, they're in developing areas. How do you extend the food security to those people when you face your own issues of, of abundance of food and feeding your own population? Where do you put them? You know, where, where do they go? But when the war comes, it's not like being announced, tomorrow it will happen. Maybe you organize and you pack your essentials, but this is about saving your own soul, your own life. I can't even fathom what it might feel like to just go with the clothes on your back somewhere, and you don't know if you're gonna make it back home. But food and shelter aren't the only things the refugees need. Although they live side by side in the same camp, many of these refugees are from different tribes, speak different languages, and have different customs. Even surrounded by other people, many refugees find themselves completely alone. Martha is a young mother who lost both of her parents during the war in South Sudan. An orphan with young children of her own, she lacks the support of a family and a community. 
She is now staying in Ajumani, in a large tent with several other groups of refugees. Although they have suffered similar hardship, for many refugees, this is where the similarities end. Different tribes, different languages, and different customs make it challenging to form any real sense of community. But that certainly doesn't stop them from trying. This morning, Martha is making tea for her children and some of the other families she shares a tent with. Refugee centers like the one here in Naimanzi are able to provide families with not just food and shelter, but also with opportunities that they didn't have at home. The schools in South Sudan have been destroyed by decades of war. But here in Uganda, her children have the opportunity to go to school with the local students. Education is important, education is the key. If you have education, you have the potential of doing things. You, you need to go to school, education is good for you. You need knowledge to go back to South Sudan. You, ne you never know you will be a president of South Sudan. But you need to go to school to have that achievement. Booker spends a lot of time talking with young refugees like 17-year-old John who are not in school. School has not been a priority for many of the refugee children who have lived their entire lives in a country at war. Uh, Southern Sudanese students who are here are very lucky to have opportunity of being resettled in, in Uganda. They are allowed to go to the schools where the national students, the pupils here, go to. You see, God never makes mistakes. He, he let you run here to Uganda as a refugee. There is opportunity you, you can get here and that is going to school. What about your family? Did you leave your family back? Yeah, I live here. Is your father there? Yes. Your mother is there? Yes. Do you have brothers? No. Yeah, I'm one. You're only one? Yeah. Did, uh, did they kill some of your friends in South Sudan? Yes, you killed your friend, you killed your sister and that someone. They killed your sister? Yes. They shot? Yes. Yeah. Your sister? Yes. Your sister was older than you or younger than you? Yeah, I'm you are older? Yes. You are a younger sister yes. who was killed, yes. shot by soldiers? Yeah, sorry, sorry, brother. Yeah? But be strong, yeah? Life, life, life is like that. While the horrors of war are difficult to talk about, Booker knows that these opportunities are often the best way to inspire young refugees to change their lives. This war is a painful thing, but don't think it is the end of the world. You still have your life, use your life for a purpose. So education is the power. Get involved with the school, you will not regret. It's very cheap for him to study as a refugee. The UNSCR officer, the Prime Minister, will take care of other bills. He will only pay 7,000, I think, is for only uniform. The rest are taken care of. And so the 7,000 shillings, that's about, that's about three or four dollars. It's, it's about that, yeah. And that's just for the uniforms, and then everything else is covered? Everything will be covered by the UNSCR and Office of the Prime Minister. All he, all he does is to buy uniforms to look like the rest of the students in the school. Although, there are now so many refugee children being added to the Ugandan school system who are not able to afford uniforms, that it's starting to be kids wearing uniforms who don't look like their classmates. This influx of new students is putting a lot of pressure on Ugandan schools, which were already not in great shape. Today, Naimanzi Primary School is getting a shipment of desks to accommodate the quickly increasing class size. Think how foreign that is to them, really. Perhaps for some of the younger children who've never actually had, you know, a school setting, suddenly they're put into a school setting. You know, you're sitting at a desk in a chair and you're thinking, wow, you know, what are these things? Because uh, I may not have owned a chair, let alone a desk before. And, and now I'm sitting in this learning environment and, and, and while that's a great opportunity, at the same time, it's almost like, wow, you know, how do I cope with so much change in my life? Even good change brings about a response of grief. For Akut Majak in grade six, getting ahead in school has become her main focus. As challenging as the life of a refugee can be, there's still an opportunity here for her to take advantage of. Only one in six women in South Sudan can read or write, and many of them are not allowed or not able to attend school. So for Akut Majak, 
Making your education a priority is the chance at a very different future. But not all of the refugees find it easy to concentrate on their studies. Even with the opportunities being offered, they are often distracted by the struggle of starting a new life. It's especially difficult for so many children whose families have been torn apart by war. Many of these children we have here, they tell us that they, are, they left their parents behind. Some, their fathers, they are in the front line in Sudan. They said some uh, died in the fighting, during the fighting. So they are often here, so that is the major challenge which we are facing. It is estimated that 17% of South Sudan's entire child population is without one or both parents. This is not an easy life, especially for a kid who is all alone, without his parents, without his brothers and sisters, left to take care of himself in a country where he knows no one. Surviving as a refugee is incredibly hard. Doing it as a child alone is almost impossible. Fourteen-year-old Emmanuel ran by himself to Uganda after his father was killed in the war. He thinks that his mother and sister are in South Sudan, but he has no way of contacting them. During the day, he goes to school and spends time with some of his friends in the resettlement camp. But at night, he's completely alone. It must be scary for these kids whose parents have been killed or are missing to have to go to bed at night by themselves in a strange country. This morning, Emmanuel is headed to school where he will be joining his classmates for one of their most important lessons. In some ways, it's even more important than reading and writing. Today, these students are gonna learn about farming. Teaching these kids about agriculture is teaching them how to live. This is a country where you survive on the crops that you grow. So learning how to grow your own food is a necessity. Cassava and sweet potatoes, we shall plant them in one row. Then the Irish potato together with the cocoyam, we shall plant them differently. What they're learning through these schools is not just agricultural techniques. What we're also training them in is the literacy, numeracy, small business skills and other skills so that when the opportunity arises for them to return, that they can begin to plant their crops and not just create you know, enough food for their family, but actually to create an enterprise. Why are we making the soil soft? Why are we cutting it like this? Huh? When we cut the soil like this, it keeps water for long. That's why we're making the soil very soft. We're actually giving them the skills to be able to go back and create something better which is going to contribute to the recovery of South Sudan at large. So for us to plant it, we shall only fix one cutting like this into the soil. Is it clear? Yes. Okay, we're fixing. Can someone go and fix? You fix the other one there. Push, push ahead, you push ahead. Push. In the middle. Uh -huh. We're facing a major crisis within South Sudan. We're facing a situation which people are saying is mounting to becoming one of the greatest famines of our modern history because nobody's left to plant a crop. So these kids learning how to plant vegetables and survive on their own food sources is such a powerful lesson. They aren't being given a handout. They are literally being given seeds for a sustainable future. And it's not just a few plants. The amount of farming being done by the schools is extensive. So all from there up to down there, this we planted cassava. 
Agabu Faustin is the principal at Baroli Primary School. 60% of the students are refugees that have come within the past year. These are also orchard like this one. This is a mango tree. Oh. Uh, this mango. This line for mango. That one is for orange. Mm. See the mangoes mm. and oranges orange, and, and guava, guava over there. Yeah. So these trees over here, what are these? These are cassavas. So just like the seeds that we looked at over there, yeah. this is how it's going to be? This is how they, they, they grow. You can see how it cracks. Eh? These are the cracking. Where? If you see the cracking, it means they are ready. So once the ground starts yeah. cracking near the cassava, yes. it's ready to go? It's ready to go. You remove it, have it, you remove it, you peel, you wash it, after washing, you eat. In the future, this will be self-reliant. That is what our target is. So the next time I come here, I can have a mango and a guava, guava and an orange. And orange, even a, how do you call the other one? Our local language we call Pratelo Asi. <laughs> I'll have one of those too. Yeah. Some of these kids have come from unimaginable horrors, but it was clear to me that these refugees want more than just food and water and shelter. These refugees want a better future. If these children are able to work by themselves, can they get this knowledge that if I planted this, what can it give to me? Will it only be the fruit? Will it be the environment? Will it be the knowledge acquired at the end of it? That's why we are having this project. Good, that you first remove this one. Even if they get integrated into the schools, even if they are given land to resettle, can the refugees ever be a part of this country that is not their own? Many of them have never celebrated this thing because of the, the, the war that have been going around their country. They have never seen independence. Can these kids celebrate Uganda's independence when they have never known their own freedom? Ugandan Independence Day, a celebration of independence won from Great Britain in 1962. It's very important for Ugandan to celebrate that day. Since we got that independence, we, we look at the achievements so far we have got since we got our independence, and we count that there are many. But what is it like for the refugees who have fled their own war-torn country to be suddenly swept up in this patriotic celebration? Many of them have never celebrated this thing because of the, the, the war that has been going around their country. They have never seen independence. Uganda temporarily now is their country. And so they see a lot of different tribes marching together in the name of independence for the country they live in. So they think this is our country also. Many refugees march in the Independence Day celebrations, a clear indication of how important their temporary home has become. If the fighting in South Sudan continues, it is possible that many of these kids will spend their whole childhoods in Uganda. It is not uncommon for refugees to stay for years in temporary settlements. Although we have so many refugees in this area, we are living together as Africans. Whatever problems our neighbors have, we should go in and help. We believe in sharing, in brotherhood, having Africa as one continent with one people. And we pray that soon there will be brotherhood in the, in the whole continent. In a country that has so little, 
it is incredible to see how much they are willing to give. Even these Ugandans are not, are not rich, but they want to share the same little they have together with the, the southern Sudanese refugees. When these children begin to share things like this, they will know that this is the way forward. Their generation will be a generation of power and unity and knowledge because of education also that they are getting. Whatever little they have, a Ugandan will share with the one who does not have. Whether it is food or shelter or water, they will share. So for us, we, we believe in sharing. And sharing is a way of saying we like you, we love you. You are part of us. I'm just imagining what if it was me instead of the Southern Sudanese refugees. I would love to be treated fairly with respect. If I want to be treated with respect, I have to reciprocate. I need to do it to somebody else. What is good for me is good for somebody else. This is a place where people are really making the best of a bad situation. Even with all of the unimaginable horrors that they have come up against, you can see in the faces of these kids that hope is not lost, that love is not lost. I believe we are all one. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what tribe you belong to. We believe that God created man in his own image. So whether they are Ugandans, whether they are Sudanese, whether they are Arabs, they are all created in the image of God. And so that unity in believing that God is the, the supreme being in our lives is a very important thing, which they are now learning. And I think as they grow up, this gener their generation will be a generation with love and unity together to build their own country. God is the center of what we do. We appreciate everybody amidst challenges, amidst any limits, we appreciate them. Just the same way God appreciates each one of us. You see, God doesn't come from heaven to help them, but through me, God gives me power and knowledge to, to serve my neighbor. That is a blessing that I, I don't want to forget. I'm proud to be a Ugandan. We are generous, we are happy people. We don't want to see people suffer. And that's why we are, when people are in need, we really come in to help. Changing one life at a time. If at least I am able to change your life, meaning you will be able at least to change one person's life. And that one person must be able to change another person's life. Meaning the chain continues. At the end of it, we change the world. Thank you.